Today, I'm going to argue that while there are several uh, very successful global ventures, the Gates Challenge really requires that academics and entrepreneurs and many successful managers think, think and rethink our mindsets and expand our thinking when, what, by what we mean by globalization, by poverty, and the multiple dimensions of free enterprise. Our minds don't simply, simply absorb all, everything that comes across us. We can't. You can't listen to me, look at what the furniture's made of, wonder if the carpet's recycled, look at the ceiling, think about what you're going to do next, uh, when are you going to go out afterward, what the basketball team did today. We can't, we can't do that all at once, even if we try to multi-channel. So what we do is we select the data of our experience, and we organize it and order it in certain kinds of ways, creating mindsets or mental models. And we all do this. We have to do this. You couldn't even function if you had to think about which toothpaste to use early in the morning. You can just imagine then how the rest of your day would go. You wouldn't get any place. Uh, so it's very important that we do that. However, sometimes our mindsets become narrow and focused. And we do that because of our culture, our upbringing, our, our religion, and our education. And, but sometimes we get trapped in these mindsets and we find it difficult to think think in more global or broader terms. But look how from about 1000 AD, nothing much happened. We had very little ec ec economic growth in the industrialized world until 1800 and the Industrial Revolution. And since then, we have just boomed. And these, of course, are all the developed countries. And you can see how well we have done. We've done that through industrialization. So it's a very critical thing. So this is his challenge, that corporations have who operate in this developing context in the poorer countries have an obligation not only to make profits, but also to improve the lives of others who don't fully benefit from this industrial revolution and from the market forces. But that sounds terrific, right? We all say, oh, that's wonderful. Gee, I just think that's grand. But how do you do it in practice? And that's what I want to talk about. How should you operate in this environment? Well, there's a great, and, and meet the Gates challenge. Well, there's a great temptation, a temptation which we've all fallen into, and now I'm going to sound like Scrooge and Dickens, and that is philanthropy. Now, that sounds like a good idea, right? We'll just throw money at it. And we've done that in the past. We've done that in the past, and this is what's happened. Since 1950, the developed countries have spent $13 trillion on poverty. We get an F in Africa. Nothing has happened in Africa. Nothing, nothing. It's not except for South Africa. Nothing has improved. Since the earthquake in Haiti, and you all probably gave money for the earthquake, uh, they're in Haiti now, they're something, they're, they're thousands and thousands of non-government organizations working in that country. Uh, the US alone has committed $3.3 billion, and globally we've committed $8.4 billion pledged for Haiti. We've used less than half of it because of the corruption in the country. People are still, half a million people are still in tent cities. Very, very, very little progress. It looks pretty much like it was after the earthquake with a little cleaning up. So the philanthropy there has not worked. It has failed. These are just some of them. And I'm not going to tell you all about them. You can look them up yourselves. This was the original one. UN Global Compact, you can look up. These are all various clothes. Even Hans Kung, who's a theologian, has gotten in on this. Everybody's in on this. If you have insomnia, you can read the ISO 26,100 100 pages of what you should do. I've only gotten to about page five. No one, no one can read all that. What are you doing to those cultures? Imagine seeing a road for the first time. Imagine seeing a, a, an SUV for the first time. Imagine seeing this big pipeline going in and this huge equipment it takes to do them. I mean, you just have to think of yourself in a completely different world. These, these are like, you know, weirdo foreigners coming in and doing this damage to their land. So we're just not sure how, what they, whether they're doing more good or harm. It's just a very interesting case of moral risk of a company that actually is trying to do the right thing. Nike decided to adopt the principles of the UN Global Compact. However, they work in countries where children 14, year olds, 14 years old work. And they work because they have to support their families. Well, that's against the UN Global Compact, right? You're supposed to be 16 or 18 or something. And many of you remember being 14, and you could have worked, right? And you thought the working laws were dumb. I'm sure you did. Uh, but 
So Nike had to figure out how they were going to do this. Well, they could have just stopped hiring these kids, but then they would have put many, many families in desperate situations. So they compromised, and they have now part-time schools in their factories to go along with the workers. But notice it's a compromise. It's not perfect, but it works in certain contexts, particularly in Vietnam and Indonesia. So you can see that meeting these, these challenges of Gates, we have to really think contextually as well as globally about what we're doing. The idea is that you move people from individual loans into these cottage industries that then create a really sustainable standard of living. And of course, probably the next step is industrialization. Maybe, we'll have to see. In operating in the global markets, you can have small enterprises. You don't need to have big multinationals. You don't need to be ExxonMobil to operate in these countries. You can have small enterprises. But, the, but the, I call this the Adam Smith proviso because in all of these areas, you have to provide living wage jobs. Sweatshops, which you've all read about, I'm sure, pay people under minimum wage, have people work in abhorrent conditions, and then they export everything to the developed world because no one who works in a sweatshop can afford to buy it. When you do that, you're not creating new markets. So you're not creating economic growth. You can think about my, the, my, my poorest countries, the bottom of the pyramid. And, that, and so what you're doing is just exploiting and rather than creating economic growth. This is the situation this year in 2012. Most global companies are still from the developed nations, from Western Europe, United States, Canada, and Japan, and now Korea. Most of these developed nations, including the one that we're in right here in Kansas, have massive debt, large unemployment, and gross stagnation. And for those of you going in the job market, you know that. And today, one out of three people in the United States live in poverty by our standards. Yet the developed countries and the developed and the developed uh, and the uh, large multinationals, we keep telling everybody what to do. Right? We're bossy, and you know how we love bossies. So we we advise these less de these LDCs or the less developed countries. Sorry, I had to abbreviate that. We tell them that they should have low debt, increased unemployment, and economic growth. But but we're not doing that. We're not doing that, and we still imagine everybody's dependent on us, but they're not.